And greetings. Happy Tuesday. Welcome to the Steve Day Show here live and on demand on Blaze TV, radio and podcast. I am down here in Dallas for the uh, the huge coverage that uh, the Blaze is going to provide tonight for perhaps, well, it's at least the first and perhaps the only debate. I'll tell you more about that here in a moment. Uh, but Todd and Aaron are back there in Des Moines. Good to see you two guys. Always good to be brought to you by our friends over at First Cup Coffee Company. They have a flavor for every freedom-loving American. It's a Christian-owned Patriot Coffee Company that has the same values of faith, family, and freedom that you do. And they make a pretty hella cup of coffee as well. Don't take my word for it. I'm not much of a coffee drinker. I'm a big coffee smeller. That's creepy. But Aaron is a very big coffee drinker, and uh, he will swear by it. All right? So it is shipped to you within days of being roasted. They put the roast on date right there on each and every bag. And you can get a discount when you go to firstcup.com and use the promo code DACE. That's firstcup.com, promo code DACE. I mentioned the big coverage we're having tonight here on The Blaze. You do not want to miss it tonight, beginning at 8 p.m. Eastern. Uh, Glenn Beck, of course, uh, Liz Wheeler, uh, myself, Ali Beth Stuckey, Dave Landau, uh, Stu, uh, a cast of literally tens. All right, we're pulling out all the stops. We're emptying the tank because it might be the only chance we get to do this with a Trump-Kamala debate is tonight. So mark your calendars, all right? You can uh, watch the whole thing and get access to uh, chatting on the app with us and everything else if you are a subscriber. If you're not yet a subscriber and you want that to access and uninterrupted coverage, go to blazetv.com slash debate and get $40 off your subscription with the code debate. Biggest subscription discount we've ever offered. $40 off with the code debate at blazetv.com. TV.com slash debate, or you can take the uh, the cheaper, lesser version and just watch us live tonight on YouTube. All right, coming up on today's show, next hour, our good friend Megan Bashan will be here. Uh, the blowback, all the right enemies being made to her best-selling book, Shepherds for Sale. We'll get an update from her about that coming up in the next hour of the show. We're going to play another round of legit poll or not. We're going to take a look at where the Real Clear Politics polling average has the six decisive battleground states heading into tonight's debate. I was at dinner with our good friend Tim Young. And uh, his lovely significant other, Alex, last night, shout out to Tim, he was just on uh, the Dace Group, and we were talking about this election and going back and forth and what we thought, and we both kind of agreed, um, we're going to know a lot more 24 hours from now, we think. That's how slim these margins are going into tonight's debate. So we'll talk about that in the next hour of the show. Uh, At the bottom of this hour, for Pop Culture Tuesday, we, we don't do a lot of celebrity in memoriams on the show because I just don't think a lot of them are worthy of an in memoriam. Um, But yesterday afternoon, an absolute American icon, maybe the greatest voice in American history, uh, passed away at the age of 93, James Earl Jones, and it would be a pop culture foul of major and epic proportions if we didn't spend at least a few minutes discussing that. So we will hear at the bottom of the hour. But before we get to all of that, let's kick it off as we always do with Aaron's rundown of what happened while we were away. What happened while we were away brought to you by a new way forward means copy and paste. We are now 56 days away from the election. It is debate day and Democrat presidential hopeful Kamala has finally added an issue section to her website. The issue section of her website is titled a new way forward and details policy positions on the economy, baby murder, the usual fare. There's one problem, though, as the lefty outlet The New Republic reports Kamala's issues page, a new way forward is literally just a copy and paste from Joe Biden's policy positions. According to the New Republic, the page's source code, that's basically its forensic footprint, is largely just a direct one-to-one forensic copy of Joe Biden's policy positions he had outlined on his now doomed campaign website. Checking in on Steve Bannon's war room, no. Checking in on Fox News, no. Checking in on CNN, whose Aaron Burnett found out in real time last night, Kamala Harris is actually a communist. A K-File investigation has uncovered, meantime, a 2019 questionnaire. And in this questionnaire, Harris laid out some much more liberal stances, among them on immigration. So in 2019, in what K-File found, she said she would cut funding to ICE, writing, quote, 
our immigrant detention system is out of control, and I believe we must end the unfair incarceration of thousands of individuals, families, and children. I was one of the first senators after President Trump was elected to advocate for a decrease in funding to ICE. Well, now, of course, she's touting the Biden administration's executive order to crack down on the border. K-Files' Andrew Kaczynski joins me now. Uh, Andrew, that's pretty um, incredible on its own um, when you're talking about what you found here on ICE. What else did you find? Yeah, and this was a questionnaire that she filled out for the ACLU. And this questionnaire is really uh, an interesting snapshot in time of that 2019 Democratic primary. Uh, Kamala Harris was trying to get to the left uh, of Bernie Sanders. She was trying to get to the left of Elizabeth Warren. And you really see that in a lot of these answers. And I want to walk our viewers through a little bit of what she said. Let's just take uh, immigration and look at what she said here. She said on immigration, she made this open-ended pledge uh, to end immigrant detention. She said she supported uh, taxpayer funded gender transition surgeries for detained migrants. She also said she taxpayer funded gender transition surgeries for detained migrants. For detained migrants. She actually said she, she supported that. She wrote both wrote and answered in the affirmative when she was asked this. Oh. Melania Trump has a new book coming out and in a promotion video for that book, she expresses outrage over her husband's near assassination and says, I can't help but wonder. Why didn't law enforcement officials arrest the shooter before the speech? There is definitely more to this story, and we need to uncover the truth. Amidst the backdrop of savage Haitians roaming the streets of Springfield, Ohio, an MS-13 murder being allowed to attend school in Maryland, and an illegal getting charged with child rape in Martha's Vineyard after being released from a prison a few months ago for strangling someone, Biden-Harris Department of Homeland Security Secretary Alejandro Mayorkas tells the Texas Tribune his real thoughts about the policy of deportation. And I, by, yeah. by the way, uh, forgive me. I was speaking of operational reality. I was talking about practicality. I was not talking about policy. I didn't address the fundamental issue of whether that is good policy. Do you want to say whether or not it's good policy? Um, it is not good policy. The left-wing Michigan Supreme Court yesterday ruled RFK Jr. must stay on that state's ballots. RFK Jr. fought to gain ballot access in the state and is now having to fight to get off the ballot after dropping his independent presidential bid. Moving on, housing affordability is now worse than it was during the peak of the last housing bubble. According to data from the Atlanta Fed compiled by economist Charlie Bilello, the median American household would need to spend nearly 44 percent of their income to afford the median priced home for sale. Back during the peak of the last housing bubble, that figure was around 42 percent. And finally, this last weekend in college football, here's SEC Shorts. I thought you said this was going to be another quiet college football weekend. I don't know what happened. There were only two top 25 matchups. Calling all the shifts. Start triage. Let's get to work. We just gave this guy a wide receiver talent infusion. He's back already? These non-contested QB interception numbers are offsetting their effect. I told him to hit the portal. He wouldn't listen. Cal just posted a final score graphic on Twitter. Any accompanying text? It just means more. Ugh. Give me a crash cart in here. He completed six forward passes the whole game. I I've never seen anything like this before. He's reverted to a 1920s offense. Hey there, doll. Any chance A&M gives our coach the old Hayaruski? Mm, definitely not. Oh, nerds. We got your team culture scans back in. The results are enough that we're going to admit you to ICU. Intensive care? Imminent coach unemployment. What? No. Prime just needs a few more years to get his players in place. We're building a foundation here at Colorado. That's why he's not messing around, going and recruiting at high schools, or fostering relationships with our feeder pipelines. Oh. Oh, wait. Yeah, I get it now. Yeah. Yeah. Again, that's from the account SEC Shorts. You can watch that full thing on all of their social media accounts. It goes on for another four minutes. And that's what happened while we were away. Aaron's Montage brought to you by our friends over at Relief Factor. If you remember a time and a place when you were agile, mobile, and the, all the right kinds of hostile, and you'd like to get back there, but you're thinking, my time has passed. Well, it, it is possible. You know, I, I'm, I'm over 50 now, so I'm, I'm closer to my time passing than uh, passing me by, okay? So these bodies, don't, uh, they don't last forever. It is very possible that uh, 
you know, your best days are behind you. It's also very possible, however, that you're giving up the ghost a little too soon. Chances are it's chronic pain, which is two inch inflammation in your joints that is causing all that achiness and stiffness and soreness that just lingers and won't let go. Why not take 20 bucks and spend three weeks with our friends at Relief Factor to see if you don't see a difference in your pain level in three weeks or less? That's all you got to do. The three week quick start. It's a drug free product, a supplement created by physicians who can prescribe drugs that goes right after the inflammation in your joints. Over the years, over 1 million people have taken the three week quick start and seen such great results 70 percent of them have stuck around long term to use the product after three weeks so again just 20 bucks to see if you don't see a difference in your pain in three weeks or less at relieffactor.com again relieffactor.com i need to go back and correct what i just said about the debate by the way i sent you guys to the wrong landing page so that's on me okay Uh, so i gotta make sure i correct that all right blaze tv.com slash dace is where you can go. BlazeTV.com slash Dace and use the code debate at BlazeTV.com slash Dace. Use the code debate there for $40 off to make sure you don't miss any of our coverage tonight. This is the biggest discount we've ever offered on Blaze TV. This is the best way for you guys to make sure you get our content without directly from us, without uh, big tech censorship. BlazeTV.com slash Dace, D-E-A-C-E, promo code debate to get $40 off at uh, BlazeTV.com slash Dace. All right, a couple of things in uh, Aaron's montage that... um, that I want to tackle. One is is a suggestion I am confident can be persuasive. The other is a question I have absolutely no answer to whatsoever. So let's start with the latter. Guys, I got to ask you. What what was Aaron Burnett doing last night on CNN? I have no, I have no, idea. no idea what that is. Well, what I I don't have a hypothesis. I I don't have a theory. It's the night of the first debate. Um, Kamala actually got some decent battleground state polling yesterday. Two came out that showed that she was ahead of North Carolina, which would crush us, so that better not be true. Okay? So help me understand here. It's too late to get rid of her. Right? So any theories or at all on what Aaron Burnett was doing last night? A little bit, and it's scary as hell. The, the hope, we, we talk about the spirit of the age, you know, how self-aware is this? Who's pushing the buttons? You know, I'm still amazed she's debating, uh, but it tells me one of two things. It's a trap tonight in the debate, and this is going to be a much different press than it was uh, last time. But, Steve, as Tim uh, Young just said he actually has a, a certain degree of confidence in who's going to be asking the questions tonight. So the other theory is that is that the the darkness is way more organized and more in control in many ways than we fear, and that they they know they can't win. So th- th- this is too heavy a lift. Why even try? That again, that's a level of self awareness. Actually, we wish they didn't have. That they're just spasmodic, and, and this is at the end here. They've they've tried everything, and they're and they really have no control. If they are self aware and self controlled enough to let this thing go, let her embarrass herself. But then they're going to turn right around, and you know they'll say it's about a, a racist and sexist culture, and they are fully prepared to turn all the cannons on Donald Trump from the second he enters uh, the West Wing again. Um, I think that might be what it is. And I, my hope was that, you know, this whole system of of progressivism it had just kind of like turned into a laugh track. But I, I don't I don't think I think they just know that this is too heavy a lift. So they're gathering all of their powder and they're saving it. And what we're going to basically have a civil war the next four years with Trump in the White House. So. This is an attempt by them to create some form of credibility um, mask that when they then demagogue the Trump presidency from the moment he is sworn in, if not declared the winner on election night, they can say, no, we told you the truth. Kamala was too radical. Blah, blah, blah. That's that's what you think is happening, perhaps. 
uh, well, th that's part of it. They'll have that option on the table, but they'll do this and feel out what, or they'll just say, you know, the, uh, everybody was racist and misogynistic and wasn't ready for the first black uh, female president, and then they'll turn okay. the race wars up against Trump. It could be any number of things, but this shows a level of them being able, we think in many cases their soldiers can't help themselves, but the fact that they seem there to be able to just slow down a little bit and we don't believe they're being honest there. I know none of us believe that. But the fact that they're not lighting their hair on fire and able to do that is, it, Steve, there's one word for it, and it's nefarious. I had the exact same reaction if, last night ahead, when Aaron. I saw that, uh, that 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 you had. I'm like, what? It was the uh, it, what it was the Blink 182 music video. It was that. That that was my reaction. I, I don't <laughs> understand what what their angle is here and we're so used to just not even having any of this covered from mainstream media that we're all you know rightfully so jumping to the worst possible conclusions and maybe another worst conclusion is it's, it's either one of two things resignation along the lines of what todd was saying or confidence that no matter what exactly. we say here uh, you know pro or, or anti Kamala, we think we're probably going to have this one in the bag anyway. So it doesn't really matter. Might as well just say whatever we want to say. So one of See, two things, I just do not trust, you know, they're both I'm terrible. Sorry. Answers. I, I'm, I'm sorry. I just don't trust the mainstream media. Breaking news. I, I something nefarious is afoot there. Okay. I, I'm, I'm not going to sit here and say I have no idea what's going on and then, you know, two smart guys that I pay out of my own pocket give me their take and then dismiss it. I, I'm open to – there's almost nothing you could have said that I would have dismissed because I really don't know. My best guess, frankly, cocaine. That, that's really my best guess. I mean, when that's doubt, an optimistic when take, quite frankly, Steve. That's, that's yeah. Mr. Sunshine <laughs> over there. I'm hoping for cocaine. <laughs> when in doubt – if it doesn't make any sense and it's kind of and it's isolated like if 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 there are more outlets doing what Aaron Burnett just did that absolutely bolsters your hypothesis and and moves it in not from a hypothesis Todd to a theory at that point um but you know when we're just it, you know someone acted at, you know completely counter to their nature and it's just one particular moment you know sometimes the best i've got is uh cocaine that's the best I've got. You know, cocaine is a hell of a drug. And I just, because that is, that is, that's some of the most stunning video I've seen all this so far this year in a year of stunners in a year where we watched a, uh, uh, Melania is correct. They let her husband take a shot right to the face. No doubt in my mind about that. hundred percent, zero doubt, none. And in a year where we watched uh, an active coup by this exact same media and outlets like Aaron Burnett and CNN take out a sitting president. For me to say that's one of the most stunning videos I've seen so far this year, I think speaks volumes. It is one of the most stunning videos I've seen this year. I was gobsmacked. I'd already seen it. Watching it again, I was gobsmacked. I, I'm open to whatever Todd and Aaron said, and I'm open to also proffering that it could very well be cocaine. All right, let's let's get to something I'm much more on sure footing with. All right. And we're going to get more into this next hour, but these margins, man. Whew. Now, we could come in here at this time tomorrow. And I mean, Kamala could have planted harder than she did for for Willie Brown. Okay. And we'll have a completely different take. But as of right now, these margins are redonkulous. Just a little tease in what we're going to walk you through next hour. If you take the real clear politics polling average of battleground states, so take the six battleground states, average them out together, the average margin is 0.6. 0.6. That's crazy. I told you last week, we're, we're dealing with subsets of subsets now, right? It's, it's not so much, well, how much does Trump win whites by? Well, it's, it's, more, it's more pinpoint than that. It's not so much how much does Trump have to win white men by? It's even more pinpoint than that. We're like, is it... Is it do white men without college degrees vote more than white men with bachelor's degrees? 
you know, we're, we're layering the ball right now. Nobody's wide open. We can't throw anybody open. So both sides right now are trying to plant the ball, throw a lot of deep outs that land between corners and safeties and layer the football. And those are very tight windows to throw the ball into. That's where we are right now. And, and that means just a skosh of complacency. A little bit of that leaven ruins the entire batch here. And a woman that, after potentially, maybe, doing a couple of lines of cocaine, Aaron Burnett realized is a mother bleeping communist, okay, running the country as a front for the demonic forces behind her, makes every call for the next four years, every hire, everything. Let me, let me package together a message. If you've got complacent, normie, non-communist family members, just, just bottom line and, and connect the dots of two things in Aaron's montage and put them together. The Kamala administration doesn't believe in deporting anybody. And this is the worst housing market in American history. Just shelter and security are kind of important guys, right? For like everybody, you know, I would think, you know, can I afford a place to live? And can I live in a country that's safe to live, right? Those would seem to be pretty all encompassing issues that cast a wide net. And I, I think that, you know, on shows like this, where we put on our analytical hat, we can, we can get very circumspect about what the campaigns and the candidate themselves are doing. But this is a team effort. There are things we can do. And if you've got people in your orbit and your nexus right now that are like, oh, I don't know, man, I don't know. No, I don't want to. I just, I can't. I, you know, mean tweets. I, I just, I can't. I mean, I just, I don't know. I don't want to do this again. I know she's bad, but I guess I can't. I mean, I can't, you know. They don't believe in deporting anybody. And this is the worst housing market in American history. Because when, when we analyze this housing market, that's just housing affordability in terms of market factors within the real estate market. But there's other factors here. That's taxes and fees across the board on numerous fronts. Inflation across the board on numerous fronts. This is the worst housing market in American history. I mean, I, I would think the ability to afford a home, for your kids to buy a home, and to live in a homeland that isn't overrun by thugs and drug dealers and human traffickers and invaders, if, if, it, it may not work. I mean, the... People keep asking me who are normies and ask me how many normies are in your audience. I don't believe any normies are in this audience. Not, not a one. And if there is one, they came upon here by accident. Uh, normies are, particularly if you live in suburbs and exurbs of America, the three of us do, many of you do. These are many of your neighbors. They're like Bartleby the Scrivener. I would prefer not to is basically their answer to everything. Every, every form of confrontation, I would prefer not to. Unfortunately, we need some of these people to vote for us. I wish I could tell you how many, because I don't know. I, I have no idea what the margin of cheating is. I, I don't know. I, I don't have a clue. And I, I can't foresee knowing. In fact, I think this election is going to probably tell us what a margin for cheating is moving forward. Because they're going to have to cheat. 
And we all know they will. So we need outliers, man. And we need some of those normies that didn't show up for us in the midterms. They didn't show up for us in 2020. We, we need some of those normies. And your neighborhoods are going to be overrun by MS-13 gangs and Haitians on the prowl for pet food, as in your pets for food, from an administration that believes in deporting apparently no one. And then this is the worst housing market of all time. I, you know, if that doesn't do it, short of a, a personal tragedy befalling them individually, none of us would root for. I, I just don't know that that message is conjurable in this race. So I, I would take these two things, tie them together, and hammer them home. I think there will be some kind of fight in Congress here soon on this immigration stuff. I think Mike Johnson, how do I put this? He's going to, I don't want to use the word fight, but maybe approach the term for a period of time. <laughs> maybe that's, that's what I'm being told. That's how I'll describe it. But at least that would give us some, a couple of news cycles of driving this home. We can't live like this. So I would tie those two things together. And man, I, I would be hammering your normie friends and family members. Hey, have you noticed how long that house down the street's been for sale? Remember when houses on this street were barely for sale for 30 days? And if they were, we thought something was wrong. Hey, have you heard about what's going on in Springfield, Ohio? Why do you, why do you think that can't happen here? Todd and Aaron, what do you think? Well, these are the two issues you bring up are classic provider protector messages. And you recall mm -hmm. earlier this week or late last week, I asked about the, the, the difference between mail and voting. And maybe the Democrats are seeing that gap closing because if it closes, it's going to be because some men at least finally have ears to hear and eyes to see. Yeah, you know, I really do like being comfortable, but I got it kind of check some of these boxes if I'm going to want to stay this comfortable in the future. Um, if, if they don't, it's going to be because, it, again, nefarious. Uh, men have simply accepted that um, they ha they're, tra they're trapped. They want to stay trapped. They don't want to be involved. Because what you're explaining, Steve, is not, I mean, you've done this for a long time, and I know you've sat in strategy sessions with people running for president of the United States, and sometimes you feel like you're dodging bullets. What you just said is one plus one equals two. That mm -hmm. should close the deal here. It should be game over. If it's not, we just have, a, a, you know, a, men, are si men are simply, they don't care that Monster Liberty is running the show anymore. That's actually what they desire. They're not threatened by that. That doesn't hurt their feelings. They just want to be left alone to play video games. Um, if it does work, I really think we're going to see that male-female vote gap that we talked about earlier this week close because of what you just said. This environment should be overwhelmingly, overwhelmingly reactionary. And I don't mean reactionary in terms of pro Republican, pro Democrat, just reactionary, like 44, 48. What was it? What was the figure that I said? 44 percent of my income goes to, to purchasing or to paying off a home. That's ridiculous. That's absolutely ridiculous. You know, the cost of gasoline, the cost of groceries, things that should just be an automatic baked into the cake backlash to whoever's in charge right now, whether it was Democrat or Republican. Mm -hmm. But you look down ballot. You don't see that at all, as you po pointed out yesterday. You don't see that reactionaryism at all. This should be this should be a simple mathematical election. One plus one equals two. One is things are really bad. One is uh, we've got leaders who are making them re really making things really bad, and they need to be held accountable. That equals two. But right now, I think we're doing transgendered math in this country. And again, the results of this election are going to answer a lot of the questions that we have. Yes. They're not going to be some great answers, I fear, but I'm still holding out hope. We'll come back and uh, for Pop Culture Tuesday, a tribute next.
One place where that parallel economy we'd all wish we had fully right now is fully available and ready is with our friends over at Patriot Mobile. If you are tired of giving your money to corporations that are fine with inflation, the stalling economy, the dying culture, why are you tuned in here? Because you're tired of it. But now you're looking for an option. You've got an option with our friends at Patriot Mobile. You don't have a lot of options in a lot of under a lot of other industries. But when where you do is the one industry we all need nowadays. That's a mobile phone. Make the switch today at PatriotMobile.com slash Steve. You get a free month of service with the offer code Steve when you do so. What will you get? The same coverage you get from everybody else. PatriotMobile.com slash Steve. They've got just as good of networks as everybody else. You get to, a, a chance to switch to any of their networks anytime you want for free. So if you're moving anywhere across the state or across the country, one signal is better than the other. One network's better than the other. You can make that switch anytime you want. If you're a veteran or first responder, let them know when you go to Make the switch. They've got extra ways to say thank you for your service, but all of us can get a free month of service right now when we go to patriotmobile.com slash Steve and use the offer code Steve. That's patriotmobile.com slash Steve. Use the offer code Steve. I want to keep hammering this as well, too. Tonight, the big debate coverage here on The Blaze. Go to blazetv.com slash Dace. blazetv.com slash Dace. Use the promo code DEBATE. It's the biggest discount we've ever offered, 40% off an annual subscription to Blaze TV, $40 off tonight, right now, available to you. So you get all the coverage of the debate tonight, everything backstage, chats, everything, blazetv.com slash dace. Use the promo code debate for $40 off, promo code debate at blazetv.com slash dace. All right, let's have a little Pop Culture Tuesday, gentlemen. This is where we look at the intersection between what is trending in pop culture and what we're trying to conserve on our end of things. And I I just think we would be remiss today if we did not honor the life and legacy of maybe the greatest voice in American history. James Earl Jones. Passed away yesterday at 93 years old. And when you think of some of the great voices in American history, you think of the dawn of the radio era, the broadcast era, era, Walter Winchell, for example. Think of Walter Cronkite, Morgan Freeman, John Facenda. But to me, I mean, James Earl Jones is the one voice to rule them all. And if you are... I mean, if you grew up in our era as a millennial, in Aaron's era, as a Gen Xer, and Todd and I's era, chances are, especially if you're a dude, the first voice you ever tried to impersonate, or one of them anyway, was James Earl Jones as Darth Vader. And just so many great memories. It was... One of the few things that uh, my, my stepdad, where I got my last name from, one of the few things him and I had in common is a love of science fiction and particularly Star Wars. I do not have a lot of great memories of you know father-son bonding growing up with Dave, but the few that I have are mostly associated with Star Wars. And our mutual love for Star Wars. I, I remember waiting in line. We lived in L.A. at the time. And waiting in line as a seven-year-old kid uh, outside of uh, Man's Chinese Theater to go see Empire Strikes Back on its opening weekend. I mean, I remember that like it was last week. Um, talking into the fan... Uh, doing whatever you could. We didn't have auto-tune back then, kids. <laughs> All right. So we had to go Chris Farley, Tommy Boy, and talk into the fan to try to modulate our voice to sound like Darth Vader. But later in life, um, if you live in the state of Iowa, as all three of us do, field of dreams, and the one constant through all the years, Ray, has been baseball. And then on, a, on another note for me on a personal level is um, in, in before the 2016 football season, uh, Jim Harbaugh went out on a plane to L.A. to 
to convince James Earl Jones to do the voiceover for the new stadium entrance for the football team that Michigan was going to unveil that fall. And if you've never been to Michigan Stadium, you have never seen this unless you've watched it online because and when you see the team come out a lot of it is with the fight song and touching the banner it's you know up there with among the great entrances in college football history right well the first time I got to take my son Noah to a game in 2016 and of course I passed on my love of Star Wars to him back then when Star Wars still let you love it they don't let you love it anymore but they still let you love it back then and when I got to take him to his very first game, we had no idea. It was the season opener in 2016 against Hawaii. And we had no idea that this new video montage voiced over by James Earl Jones was going to debut. And uh, just the look on my little dude's face, who's not very little anymore. He's about to graduate high school. He's a senior now, and his voice is way more baritone than mine. And uh, the look on, but he was still a little dude. (laughs) And the look on his face, heck, the look on my face, man. It's just the two of us sitting there in this massive stadium together. Ultimate father-son moment. Get to take him to his first Michigan game. when, When I gave him the present on Christmas Day that we were going to a Michigan game that fall, and he opened that up and he read it, the dude was so worked up he broke down in tears. I mean, he dressed up as Jim Harbaugh for Halloween two years in a row. And uh, when this thing, this is the University of Michigan, when this thing chimed in, and I, I had no idea this was coming, and the crowd was stunned, and, and there's this huge thing about the history of Michigan football and everything else, and it goes right to the part that you see nowadays when you see the team come out of the tunnel when you're watching the games on TV, and the look that we had on our face, Darth, we, we had, I didn't even know James Earl Jones was a Michigan grad, so we're like Darth Vader's a Michigan fan, and, and that montage was, was just insanely cool, and then that moment, and when the fight song comes on and the team comes out, that's another memory, a father-son memory now where I'm on the dad side of things. I mean, I remember, I remember Labor Day Saturday 2016 in great vivid detail. I've still got videos on my phone over here of my little dude giving me his reports on the game as we're watching it. And uh, that was just phenomenal. And so for, for me as a kid, child of the 80s in many respects, James Earl Jones was kind of the narrator of Americana associated with some of my greatest uh, hobbies and pastimes and and pursuits of happiness both growing up with my own dad and now as a dad myself and um, I just I wanted to tip my cap man just what a legacy and what's funny is I you do research on this guy you'll find anybody's ever said a bad word about this dude Nobody. Just a throwback and a voice that uh, with today's AI will never be silenced, but it will still be missed. And guys, I wanted to spend a few minutes just uh, here on a Pop Culture Tuesday eulogizing, I think, the greatest voice in American history. Well, and our kids, uh, Steve... And kids forevermore will know him as the voice of Mufasa. Uh, they'll know him from the Sandlot. I totally forgot about that. Yeah. They'll know yeah. him from the Sandlot, which my kids absolutely uh, love. I remember him fondly from uh, playing J- Admiral James Greer from The Hunt for Red October. Uh, mm-hmm. But, you know, I, I thought it was an interesting. You know, you. I was 77. I'm, I'm uh, five when Star Wars comes out. And like you said, Steve, that voice is ever present. But, you know, the way it's it, it's still over the years for me, the, I think the last Star Wars thing I watched was the Obi-Wan thing. And it, we talked mm-hmm. about it at the end and talked about oh, it had some highs. It had some lows. It doesn't really make sense at the end. But but when there's that final lightsaber battle between uh, in the, in that show between uh, Vader uh, and Obi-Wan and Vader's helmet has been cut open and you see half of Anakin Hayden Christensen's face but even more 
they modulated in and out of Anakin talking like a human being and Darth Vader through the robot because the mask had been slashed so the the electronics aren't working so the voice is going in from normal to Vader Vader to normal and I thought that was that was probably the coolest thing about that entire thing it just reminds you the import it's like t- Tony Stark being cast uh, uh the casting decision to make Iron Man uh Robert Downey Jr. And how that catapulted that thing. Va- you, you let the the British dude, David Prowse, voice that like he thought he was going to the whole time. Who knows if we're sitting here talking about Star Wars. It, these choices um, end up taking over in ways you can't possibly under or stand, uh, plan for. And that is the magic of movies and why, as much as we criticize them, we criticize them mostly because we do want to go back to that level of magic something we can share with our kids because again it was surprising how that hit me that 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 james earl Jones voice when it was cracking in and out and not perfect it was just like there are some things that are transcendent uh in cinema and we were lucky to experience when cinema was something that was genuinely something that families could embrace indeed Hmm. and cinema is the marriage of um cinematography of course the visual aspect but people underscore the importance of sound and and sound mixing and when you get a talent like that this is this is something that is almost well it is biological there's just very it's just so rare to have a voice like james earl jones when you marry that with the big screen you're sitting in a dark room with lights flickering on that silver screen. And you marry that with there's just the, it's called a basso profundo. That's, that's his register. It, it does create something that is magical. And it's just impossible to replicate. Even with, even with our modern technology, you're never ever going to be able to perfectly replicate that voice. And people underscore or undersell the notion of, as Todd was saying, that the choices made in some of these Im- incredible stories from yesteryear, and it is yesteryear now, that wouldn't have been the same. It wouldn't have hit the same had not for James er- Earl Jones playing a-, a key role in some of those movies. Of course, Star Wars, Star Wars known for marrying sci-fi to more of a classical score, but even that, if the performances, especially from your main villain, if, it, if he would have had any other voice other than James Earl Jones, does that movie, do those series hit the same? No, they don't. They just do not. And so it's, it's just an incredible, that, that voice is going to be sorely missed. And yeah, AI might be able to replicate it, but it's never going to be the same. And his gratitude for Star Wars, by the way, is what, you know, is totally lost in what this latest acolyte lesbians in space thing. People not grateful for it. No, we got to change it. We, every, every time I read something from D- James Earl Jones about being invited to come back and do the voice, it was just like, oh, wh- sign me up. What an honor. What an honor yes. to be a part of this whole thing. And again, this is a man who experienced real racism back in the day, but he was all like, I'm blessed. Mm-hmm. Can I be a part of this? Can I tell this story again? What? We should all learn something from that. From uh, More than the voice, which is already magical, but apparently the human being is even more magical. To that end, and I have no idea what James Earl Jones' politics were. In fact, I looked and they were kind of all over the place. He had friends everywhere, got honorary... Uh, you know, honorary uh, d- 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 decorations from George W. Bush, Barack Obama, et cetera. Here's what I can tell you, though. That, you, what are we fighting for here? Why is this a place worth saving? So here's a black man born in the Jim Crow South. And I'm trying to pronounce it. Arca Butler, Mississippi in 1931. Arca Butler, Mississippi in the 2020 census had a population of only 280 people. So this is poor of poor of poor. Father abandons the home, ends up having to be raised by his grandparents. From there, he gets into one of the top-rated public universities in the world, joins the ROTC, gets out of university, uh, goes to ranger school during Korea, converts to Catholicism, and out of this, out of from and 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 from. Arca Butler, Mississippi, in the middle of the Jim Crow South, becomes one of the few winners of what's called the EGOT. That's 
you've won an Emmy, you've won a Grammy, you've won an Oscar, and you've won a Tony Award. That's that's people like Barbara Streisand level of, of Hollywood talents that have only been the only people to do that. There's, there's, there's nowhere else on earth that that was possible than this country. Nowhere. Nowhere else on earth. And, and, and in many respects, the chance for those kinds of stories, those kinds of lives to be lived, spent, spent 34 years married to the same woman. That's what we're fighting for. For, by the way, he was a stutterer as a child. I mean, this is, this is a movie. His life is a movie in and of itself. That's what we are fighting for here. The opportunity for everybody, no matter what their background is, what their origin is, to fulfill the God-given potential placed within them. That's what we're fighting for, guys, right there. Stories like this, guys. What do you I, think? It's a, he, uh, I saw a little story today I wasn't familiar with because he also uh, was on the, the Big Bang Theory as many, you know, sci-fi people were. And they did a little bit on there at the end where he ding-dong ditched Carrie Fisher. Uh, so they were both on the show. <laughs> but that that was the first time that those two had ever met in person. And when they did, they uh, the crew saw that, and she goes up to him and says, Hey, Dad! But they had never met before yeah. because he did it all in a soundstage. Um, and so this, w- this would have been, my goodness, at least 10 years ago, prob- probably even more. Um, but again, those little ghosts, the, the, there's, there's always that ghost image that they show of now, all the Star Wars actors who have now passed, uh, passed on and he's been, uh, added, uh, to that. And again, we were, um, we were lucky kids to be five and six when that came out, Steve. And, uh, I'd give, I, I really would. I, 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 I mock all the things I do now because I, I t- for this and for sports and for things like this, I desperately want to go back. It was better. Yeah, my, my favorite meme coming out of this is uh, is the picture of the cast of the original Star Wars all together. And those who have passed on are represented as Force ghosts. And uh, photoshopped in there is James Earl yep. Jones as a Force ghost. And then Mark Hamill's brain is represented as a Force ghost <laughs> as well. <laughs> that is great. That is great. Hour two is next. We are back here with Hour 2, live and on demand on Blaze TV, radio, and podcast. Steve Dace here. I'm here, actually, in Dallas for the uh, Blaze's uh, debate coverage tonight. Todd and Aaron are back there in Des Moines. If you want to join us for that debate coverage, by the way, and you do, I mean, we've got everybody from Glenn Beck to Liz Wheeler to Allie Beth Stuckey to me to uh, uh, to Stu Burgermeister, Meisterburger, because I still don't know how to pronounce his last name after all these years. All right. We're all going to be here. And he, frankly, knowing Stu, probably wishes his last name was Meisterburger, Burgermeister. Uh, so we're all going to be here tonight. You don't want to miss it. You can uh, chat uh, with us uh, on the app, get all the, the pre and post uh, debate stuff you want. If, you subscri- if you're not yet a subscriber, though, today's the day. This is our biggest discount ever. $40 off a Blaze TV subscription today at blazetv.com slash dace. Use the promo code DEBATE. Promo code DEBATE at blazetv.com slash dace. You'll be able to watch today's overtime, which... That's my cue to tell Todd and Aaron we don't have a topic for that yet. <laughs> All right. You can watch today's overtime at blazetv.com slash dace. Uh, promo code debate and watch all of the great debate coverage tonight. I'll be on both the pre-debate show and the post-debate show here tonight. Blazetv.com slash dace. Promo code debate for the big $40, 40% off the annual subscription. Blazetv.com slash dace. Promo code debate. 
You can also let us know what you think about what we think via the SteveDace.com inbox. Email us, steve at stevedace.com, D-E-A-C-E. Like us on Facebook, MeWe and Gab. You can follow me on X, Instagram, TikTok, and Getter. That's at Steve Dace Show is where you follow me there. If you listen to the podcast, if you have not yet done so, please consider leaving us a five-star review. And thanks to all of you who have. And then also hit subscribe or if you're on iTunes, follow. And that makes sure that every time we do one of these new episodes, it will show up in your podcast feed every time. And we thank all of you that have done that for us as well. Want to thank our friends over at Raycon. You've heard me talking about their everyday earbuds. And you thought, wait a minute, I get the same audio quality uh, from the big brands, but at half the price. Sounds pretty good, but if you haven't already pulled the trigger on a pair of Raycons, now is the time to check them out because they just launched their upgraded model of their best-selling everyday earbuds. Uh, now you also get active noise cancellation, ergonomic design, multi-point connecti- connectivity that uh, lets you pair with two different devices at once. It's available in a variety of vibrant new colors as well. Um, It's got touch on for two or three of your favorite additional features, such as optimized gel tips. So you have that uh, cozy custom fit, Um, the ergonomic earbud shape to fit the widest range of ears, Uh, three customizable sound styles, awareness mode, and more. And did I mention new active noise cancellation, new quick charge function, new multi-point connectivity, new weatherproof and or sweat resistant. You can't beat it. No one, no one that's taken advantage of our Raycon code has come back to me later and said, no one has. Man, that was a waste. Only rave reviews for these guys, all right? Raycon offers a 30-day happiness guarantee, so what are you waiting for? No better time than right now to go to buyraycon.com slash Steve today to get 15% off your Raycon order plus free shipping. That's right. You'll get 15% off and free shipping at buyraycon. R-A-Y-C-O-N as in Nancy. Buyraycon.com slash Steve. That's buyraycon.com slash Steve. Steve, really quick, you know, I think right. we did a really yes, point sir. last episode, last segment, really poignant about James L. Jones, but we would be remiss, and I can't believe we didn't even bring this up. One of the four, our, our youth, this is a formative movie. How did we forget to mention his turn as King Joffy Joffer of Zamunda in Coming to America? Oh, my. Genius. Genius. Yes. I mean, I love that movie. Love I've, it. I've loved that movie for... I've, for people that don't know, over the years when I've just indiscriminately said, that's beautiful, what is that, velvet? It's from Coming to America. Yes. That's... That's what it's from. It's one of the great comedies of the 80s for sure. And, of course, he's Eddie Murphy's dad in that movie. You're right. I mean, here's the thing with that dude. I mean, he's not going to be – he's not going to have the film credit list of Nicolas Cage, right? Or Philip Seymour Hoffman where he's in like every – or even Gene Hackman, great as an actor as he is. Um, he's retired now. But uh, those guys were like in every three or four movies at, during periods of their careers. But when you talk about bang for your buck, man – No, I know. The most, I mean, it, pound for pound. I mean, wh- one of the great movie monologues of all time in Field of Dreams. That Maybe the greatest movie voice of all time in Darth Vader. I mean, just pound for pound. The, when he did show up, man, the gravitas was real and it was spectacular. So good call out of you, brother. He made even Arsenio Hall look good. That's yes. hard to do. All right. Let's get to it. Tonight, we have our very first and I think potentially only uh, debate between Kamala Harris or Kamala, if you prefer, and Donald Trump. Let's start with big picture here. I, I really don't know where things are at. We talked a lot about this yesterday, but I'm going to probably have a lot more definitive opinion here. Well... I'm definitely going to have a more definitive opinion because almost any opinion I'd give 12 to 14 to 24 hours from now is going to be more definitive than the opinion that I have right now, right? Because when I read their media, as Aaron, you have pointed out, it is very clear there is some consternation from their media. But I will tell you, when I talk to my little birdies on the ground in battleground states, I'm not, I'm not getting reports in terms of the organization we've got on the ground in these states. I'm not getting reports that that are nearly as rosy as the picture painted by Nate Silver's forecast right now, you know? And so I don't know. 
And I, as I keep saying, I, I don't know what the margin of cheating is anymore. That's why I think tonight is going to mean a lot. I don't even know how many people are going to tune in. I, I mentioned yesterday, Scott Rasmussen, not Rasmussen polling anymore, but his own poll. Scott Rasmussen came out with a survey that showed only 46% of Americans even knew this debate was happening, or of voters even knew this debate was happening, and less than 30 of, 30% thirty of them planned to watch. So, you know, we had 80 million between linear and digital watch the Biden-Trump debate on June 27th. But even if the ratings are way down, which would probably indicate an overall lack of voter interest if that's the case, we're still going to have the election, guys, I think. <laughs> but it's still on the schedule, which means even the people that tune in within that, even if it's a diminished base, because typically, just so you know, typically a general election presidential debate gets anywhere from 80 to 100 million people to watch. When it's... The June debate was way earlier than we've ever had another debate. But when we typically have these in the modern era, you know, post-Labor Day with the fall campaign in full swing, anywhere from 80 to 100 million, like Super Bowl kind of ratings is what these things get. So, um, but even if it's not that, 40 or 50 million watch, there's a lot of voters in there. And we're dealing with really scant margins. I'm going to show you here in a few minutes how scant those margins are. But I, guys, I have no idea really what's happening right now. That's why we did a whole segment yesterday. What I think we know, what I don't think, what I think we don't know. I, again, I, I do like the, the, I think the Trump campaign from a messaging standpoint is still going strong. I said last week, I really like what I see for the most part. I still think it's doing well. I even think the Trump meme team, and I think a lot of times that gets blown out of proportion in terms of its impact, but, uh, and it's, and, and the idea that that matters more than on the ground organization, maybe the day will come that that will be the case. I don't think we're there yet. Maybe we'll find out differently in November. I don't know. But the way that they have latched on to this eating cats thing in Springfield, Ohio, even I think that's been a stroke of genius. Okay. I mean, so, I, f I feel good about what the campaign is showing the American people. I just don't feel good or I, I just feel uncertain about where the campaign itself actually is. So I have just decided I woke up this morning and I made this decision uh, and I've told you guys privately and I've I've hinted at this on the air uh, multiple times. And I'm, I'm not going to be dishonest in, you know, the, the thing with Aaron Burnett last night on CNN, you know, that, that is odd. You know, uh, Kamala trying to duck the debates. You know, she's only done one interview and it's not even been live yet. You know, these are things campaigning in New Hampshire. These are things I'm just trying to say. These are things that ca campaigns do that are not confident. I have decided, though, I'm going to <laughs> I'm going to take a very dour position on this election because 2022 still happened. Did it not? It still did. We were awaiting the normies to come in. Like uh, the ride of the Rohirrim, is that? Am I getting that analogy or that? Uh, yeah. That's that. Uh, that Lord of the Rings. Yeah. Lord of the Rings analogy, correct? And that didn't happen. So, until that happens, or till something like that happens, my pat answer for the outlook on this election is 2022 happened. And the way, the reason that I'm going to do that for however large or small or in between whatever platform I'm on is. I don't want, because I am still voting for Donald Trump, so guess what? I want him to win. That's, that's what I'm saying when I vote for Donald Trump. I want him to win. I don't want any of the sitting on your butts, sitting on your hands, complacency that you were talking about in passing in the first segment, Steve. I don't want anybody within the sound of my voice, no matter how big or large or small or in between the platforms that we are on, are. I don't want anybody to get any notion of that complacency whatsoever, uh, whatsoever because 2022 happened. It did happen. That is a fact, Jack. So that's the position I'm taking from here on out, 56 more days till the election. I don't care how rosy Nate Silver's mm. forecast gets. I don't care how rosy the uh, New York Times Siena poll is. I don't care how rosy any of that is. That is that is the posture that I have. And you are right to have totally it. Totally respect that. You are right to have it, as I had the exact same posture, as you know, just until like the last couple of days. 
And w- the only thing I'm starting to sense, and I've tried to say it in multiple different ways, I, I'm I'm less thrilled with Trump's messaging because basically we're just saying it's not it's not terrible. Like it's like this is what it should be. You're running for president. We have a reasonable expectation that you don't suck at this, and often you have. You're being a grown up, so that's good. But more what I'm seeing is that they, on their side, are starting to have the same kind of worry. Aaron, as you have about our side, that's what this seems like. It's a race right now. And Steve is absolutely right. We may feel totally differently after tonight. But right now, it seems to be a race to see which side gives up first. Another version of the one who is dumbest last loses. This this is not an aspirational election yet. Um, maybe it will turn into that, but basically, like we've talked many, we were just trying to throw something in front of the disaster to buy us a little bit more time. That's not aspirational. And the left is starting to realize that uh, all of their games, all of their uh, cells, victimization, things like that are pretty played out. And this thing is just a race to the bottom. All right. So just to demonstrate the margins we're dealing with here. Um, if, if you take the average, and I'm, we're going to walk you through the battleground states here individually in a moment on legit poll or not, but if, if you aggregate where the real clear politics polling average, and I have no idea how accurate this is. It was very accurate in 2022 on the congressional ballot. They, they said they, they said they, they, they reconstructed, they threw some polls out, they tightened it up after 2020, because 2020 was a total failure of the Real Clear Politics polling average, as I've walked you guys through those numbers many times on the show since the day after the election. So they say they've, they've reorganized it. We've not had a presidential election since then, obviously, to know for sure. In 2022, the RCP average was very, very on the money about the overall congressional ballot. But the Democrats in all of the key battleground states overperformed the RCP average call. Katie Hobbs overperformed. Funny how that all worked. They they all overperformed. Huh. All went one way. Weird. Anywho, um we don't know. We're going to we're going to see here in a presidential election whether this newly constructed RCP average which had been pretty accurate until 2020 um, has been fixed after what was broken in 2020. But if you aggregate all of the numbers we're about to show you, the average margin right now in the Real Clear Politics polling average, guys, in the in the six decisive battleground states, that's Arizona, Georgia, Michigan, Nevada, North Carolina, and Pennsylvania. All right, those six. The 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 average margin in those six states is 0.6. 0.6. With an election that is eight weeks from today, 56 days from today. Never seen anything like that since the RCP average debuted in in 2000. 0.6. Thoughts on that before we start looking at these states individually? Uh, I, I, I'm not uh, surprised. Uh, we have, there haven't been enough and this is from not a, uh, Aaron's point about uh, 2022 uh, I mean, in terms of waking up to realities. There haven't been enough consequences to change that dynamic. There there should have been. If there were consequences, I believe uh, you would have seen uh, a different uh, uh, picture not, right now because there are a lot of bad guys uh, in jail paying for what they've done instead of still playing pep- puppet master with our lives. Now, this... this, this this breakdown is is never uh, going to change in a direction that favors us unless there's consequences. There's nobody, nobody should be shocked as bad as the economy is, as bad as the border is, as bad as transing our kids are, that this is still like this because uh, you know, all, whatever normies are left are, are, are still ignorant enough to see that um, – uh, they're they're going to ride the coattails of the people uh, that are usually the ones getting to tell other people who the bad guys are. Yeah, I, something is not adding up. Um, when you look at some of the polling recently that shows, it, it actually, it might actually end up adding up, but sh- some of the polling, national polling, showing recently, this is uh, basically a tie or within two, um, maybe even three points in favor of Kamala Harris. And yet all of these battleground states, and I shouldn't say all of them, but places like North Carolina, 
are favorable for Kamala Harris. You know, there is a possibility. I don't know how large it is. There's a possibility. I don't think um, I don't think there's a possibility Trump wins the, the popular vote, but there is a possibility. I would put it in the single digits right now that it could be basically a statistical tie in the popular vote. And yet Kamala Harris wins convincingly based on what we're about to go through. That is a possibility that you might need to. I don't want to go super dour or black pill here, but that is a possibility. I think it's a single digit, digits possibility, but that's still a possibility based on what we're about to see here. All right, let's let's take a look at what the RCP average. Again, this is a a collection of what Real Clear Politics views as the most credible polls out there, and then it aggregates them together into this average. So let's look at these battleground states individually so we can discuss some of the things going on on the ground there. This is Arizona. This is the most positive Trump state in the uh, in the battleground survey from RCP heading into tonight's debate has Trump at one point plus one point six. This is actually the biggest margin either candidate has in the RCP battleground state averages heading into tonight's debate. I told you that uh, one of my little birdies who's doing polling for the campaign felt uh, very strongly that about Arizona. I know Turning Point USA has done a lot of work on the ground in voting registrations in that state and has made um, some statistically documented progress, which is important because they're a key instrument that Trump is going to use for his get out the vote operation in all these states nationwide and not the Republican Party for the first time. So here you also, though, have Trump going up against Kerry Lake, whose Senate candidacy seems pretty dead at the moment. Um, uh, the Republican Party is basically spending nothing on that race compared to what the Democrats are for Ruben Gallego, her opponent. So your thoughts on Arizona, which was which was maybe the most controversial state of the last two cycles combined with what happened in Maricopa County, both to President Trump and then to Carrie Lake in her gubernatorial run in 22, which I believe, Todd, you still want uh, Carrie Hobbs uh, yeah. arrested for. Yes, arrest Katie Hobbs. Absolutely. Didn't they just discover within the last couple of weeks, like 100 to 200,000 Ill, Ill people who shouldn't be on the voter rolls? Uh, I, I think that happen here this is uh, to me this is just uh they're devoted enough there clearly uh both katie and maricopa county uh and the, the fact that uh uh carrie lake now she's just basically serving as a reminder uh of not what went wrong but emboldening people to yeah we don't want any we uh we were right about her the first time no cheating uh to make sure that uh uh she didn't get on i have i i this may be the best one in trump's uh favor based on the number you put up but i have zero confidence uh in this particular state the only thing that would stop them based on the success that they had last time and the reminder to have that success again carrie lake is that th there's just too much smoke it's not about do we want to get away mm -hmm. with it or not they absolutely want to get it there that's why some, like somebody hobbs, too much heat. Yeah. hobbs was put in there this is what your job is the stuff that she's vetoed shamelessly you know it i i i will believe it when i see it when trump wins arizona same um, same with most of All these right. states i'm going to see, i'm going to i need to see it with my own eyes before i start thinking things are somewhat back to predictable again when it comes to polling and elections like this all right let's talk about georgia which has become a recent swing state just in the last really in the trump era it, it was not a swing state before this um right now the rcp average has trump at 0.03 an advantage of 0.03 in that 0. state. 3. Georgia is one state, 0. 0.3, thank you. Georgia is one state that I do think has made some constructive changes uh, from a voter, from an election integrity standpoint, structural changes, positive. And I know some of you live in Georgia are going to tell me it ain't good enough, but compared to what most of the other states have done, though, it's, it's definitively better. I think Brian Kemp also knows if he wants any kind of future in the Republican Party here, nationally trump has to win this state i think that's a factor here too what do you guys think here's when we talk about that male female voting gap i talked about earlier georgia this i if you let this your state 
go to Kamala Harris. I, you should be kicked. Uh, Georgia should have both of its recent national titles taken away from it. You should be kicked out of the SEC. <laughs> All males should have their NFL Sunday ticket taken. Honestly, if you do not understand the math down in Georgia... Every, uh, it will just verify everything I say about sports bros all the time. It's put up or shut up time, guys, down in Georgia. If not there, where? Yeah. Um, I, I, I like that analysis, by the way. And you it, pointing out like that it. Georgia was not a swing state prior to this. I, I, again, am in show me territory because this was reliably a red state Reason, you know, relatively recently. So I'm in a show me a posture. I don't think that it's actually 0.3%. I, it should be like th- uh, 3% actually in favor of the Republicans. But again, I need to see this. Now, Donald Trump and Brian Kemp recently did kiss and make up. So that's got to account for something. If you have some sort of at least, at least he's showing that he's doing, he's not opposed to you, uh, Brian Kemp. If you're Donald Trump, Brian Kemp is at least showing that he's not opposed to you or trying to undermine you. But I, I still need to sh- I, I still need to see this with my own eyes because there's it's inexplicable, inexcusable for this really to be a swing state, a toss up state. By the way, other than Bill Clinton's romp of Bob Dole in 1996, Arizona has been a reliably Republican state as well since uh, post World War Two. So neither Arizona nor Georgia were considered swing states prior to Trump. Let's go to Michigan. This is the state the RCP average is the most positive on Kamala on. Uh, it has Kamala's average in the RCP average at uh, 1.2. I will tell you, I had a phone call with someone I know very well, who's a prominent conservative activist in Michigan yesterday, who did not give me a rosy report about what is happening organizationally with the Trump campaign on the ground in Michigan. On top of that, in 2022, We had Gretchen Whitmer led the RCP average by one point on election day, ended up winning the election by 10 points. Our very own and our dear, our very own colleague and dear friend, Sarah Gonzalez did the special for blaze TV earlier this year on election fraud, basically Michigan, the fix is just in. You're more likely to be charged with a crime in Michigan for reporting election fraud than stealing elections, you know? So this is a state that I have no idea what Donald Trump has to do to win this state. No idea. As it's currently constructed. I don't have a clue. Yeah, my, my gut says this is just off the board. Agreed. The, the polling says otherwise, but my gut says this is just off the board. Yeah, I don't think. I, because I think, of the fundamentals we were correct. just discussing? Yeah. I don't even think the margin yeah. of cheating is an issue in this state. I just think that state is increasingly becoming a toilet, and uh, it, it, it wants to live that way. I mean, what, what the degree to which they put Gretchen Whitner back in office after what she did, that's what they want. Let's go to Nevada. Now, my GOP, my Trump pollster buddy was also very high on things, uh, how Nevada was trending when I spoke to him last uh, a couple of right, right about the time that Biden was being taken out. But the latest RCP average actually has Kamala up 0.6 in that state. That's another state that's got, you know, had some had some questionable uh, voter uh, and election integrity stuff happening in 2020 by the narrowest of margins. And so, I, I mean, Trump's Trump's got to win Arizona and Nevada, I believe, both. Has to win them both. What do you think? Well, I, I was just talking to somebody recently about union vote, and that's obviously a pretty big deal uh, in, in Nevada. Yeah, the no taxes on tips thing is, the no taxes on tips thing is specifically targeted at Nevada. We have a huge service industry, obviously, there with Vegas and... And right. all the resorts and everything else. Yeah. Right. But the stronghold in uh, of Democrat politics is uh, it's it's less than it once was, but it's still way more than it should be in a sane place. So this number feels about right. A coin flip. Aaron. So this might be the biggest state from 2022. That was a disappointed a disappointment for me. Now, in 2022, Republican Joe Lombardo won the gubernatorial election. Um, Lieutenant Governor, uh, that was a Republican victory as well. Uh, Attorney General Democrats won. State legislature, it was it was still relatively uh, a disappointment for me. 
I, I don't know. I'm going off of what your little birdie said that we talked about on the air a few weeks ago, which was there is a flight out of California that's affecting Nevada and Arizona. So I think this should mm-hmm. be a bigger toss up, mm-hmm. maybe more favorable towards Republicans than what we've seen in past elections. I'm just banking on that. By the way, Trump has been unable to win Nevada either time. And uh, a Republican's not won Nevada in a presidential election since George W. Bush in 2004. And so... Uh, and it, it was reliably Republican for a while. It's been a swing state. It's It's been a state that leans Democrat. So let's go to North Carolina. And this seems to be the state we keep forgetting about. Okay. So, so this was before two polls came out yesterday. And I don't know that the RCP average has been updated. But two polls came up, came out yesterday after I got this that had, had Kamala ahead in North Carolina. But as of but before those polls came out, Aaron, when I sent you what the RCP average was, it was Trump at plus 0.1. This is a state with a lot of suburbs. You have the research triangle there. Um, the Mark, he's, he's got the albatross of the Mark Robinson gubernatorial campaign. That campaign looks like it's dead on arrival as, as of right now, not going anywhere. In fact, I think there's more of a chance Carrie Lake can resurrect her candidacy than Mark Robinson can. So... You've got the double whammy there um, where you're also going to have the Democrats get a probably pretty convincing win for governor. So I, I don't know how we can get to 270, though, without North Carolina. Every time I do the math, because it requires us to probably win Michigan. And I don't know that we want to have to win Michigan. What do you guys think? And this should not be a swing state. Just should not. Yeah, this is... This is where all of my my analysis the last couple of days about the way the left has doesn't seem to have confidence in its numbers. But then I look at this and I don't have any confidence and once we break it down this way. I mean North Carolina seems like it desperately wants to be grafted into be a Midwest state. It it just doesn't it doesn't want to be the South anymore. Um, I, I look at that and I I don't have any confidence, especially what's going on in the gubernatorial race. A, a Trumpian figure there, they're going to reject him apparently, but they're not. But then they're going to turn around and vote for Trump. I don't. I can't do connect those dots. That we, we're going to need a lot of people in North Carolina to apparently do exactly that. By the way, let's go right to Pennsylvania here. RCP average in Pennsylvania tied. I can't envision winning that. Why is nobody talking about Wisconsin? I brought this up before. Here's why. I'm glad you brought this up. I'm going to tell you why I didn't include Wisconsin. It's the most inaccurately polled state, and it's not even close of the last two election cycles. And the voter rolls and files there are awful. I, it was also the th- slimmest. I, don't even think, I, I wouldn't even look at Wisconsin polls. It was the slimmest margin in, in 2020 of the three Rust Belt states that are up for grabs. Slimmest yes. margin. Yep. This goes to show, guys, no complacency, man. None. You got to get as many of your non-communist friends and family out to vote as you can, looking at these margins. All right, back here on the Steve Day Show, powered by our friends... Over at America's Christian Credit Union. Remember back when uh, banks used to uphold the community's values and fund the local nativity scene at Christmas time? No, you don't remember that unless you're 70. Because we don't we don't have those kinds of banks anymore. Now it's uh, Pride uh, Month, Pride for Evs, brought to you by Global Conglomerate Bank. Fill in the blank here, right? Uh, America's Christian Credit Union wants to do something about this. Now, I know what you're thinking. Hey, that's great. You know, Steve, I hear you talk about the parallel economy all the time. We need it. But man, it's kind of risky to be putting my money into a new startup in the current environment. Totally get that. But America's Christian Credit Union is older than me. It's been around for 65 years. It's well into its second generation serving God, fearing Americans with integrity and faith and They've got great rates, cutting-edge mobile banking, access to over 5,000 shared branches, over 30,000 ATMs nationwide. So if you want to make the switch today for a limited time, earn $400 when you open a new checking account with qualifying activities. 
And you can also get an additional $100 bonus with the promo code Steve at checkout if you visit Americas, plural, Americas Christian CU for credit union.com slash Steve. That's Americas Christian CU.com slash Steve for complete program details. Visit Americas Christian CU.com slash Steve to get started today. Americas Christian CU.com slash Steve. Well, the name of the book, which I was proud to endorse, Shepherds for Sale, How Evangelical Leaders Traded the Truth for a Leftist Agenda, and it has caused all the right backlash. And we thought now that she can add best-selling author to her resume, she would be beyond our grasp, that we would no longer be able to connect with our good friend Megan Basham. This is likely the final time she's going to throw us some scraps, and it's good to have her back here with us on The Blaze. <laughs> Megan, how are you? I'm good. Thanks Did for I lay having on me thick enough? Day, you know. <laughs> <laughs> Did I lay that on thick enough, do you think, or do I need to do better? I can go again if you want. No, no is that, that was, good? I mean, you can say New York Times bestselling author, though I hate to give them credit because That's everyone true. knows they often snub conservatives, and they did snub me a little bit. They uh, didn't put me on the hardcover list because I would have debuted at like three or four, so instead they put me on the combined print and um, electronic list so that I'd be a little further down in the rankings, but they couldn't ignore it entirely, and I am sure that is due to your endorsement. I'm sure. And I'm and I'm also sure everybody right now that's uh, on a that is roofing, or delivering ready mix concrete is wants to hear you and I kvetch about uh, getting screwed by the New York Times bestseller right. list. But since you brought it up, the reason the reason I didn't mention that is because they did the same thing to me uh, last year with uh, Rise of the Fourth Reich, and they they even gave we had we we had the number eight overall book in the country that week. They gave. They even gave our spot on the list to Greta Thunberg, whom we sold like a hundred and thirty percent more copies than. All right. Yeah, and so they're notorious. That's for why that. I didn't and mention you, it. I'm still bitter. Yeah. You sh- and you should be, but you know, here's the deal. They they can't deny that the books are selling, and they can't take away the audience. And that is because so many people out there recognize what we're writing about. They see the importance of these subjects. And um, that's what's really bringing uh, the readers, I think, out to buy these books is not because um, in so many ways that I or you are telling them something that they don't know. We're just explaining for them. Here's why it's happening. Here's how we got here. Your book, Megan, has become a force of nature. I have uh, uh, enjoyed from afar watching you take on its detractors head on. Uh, on social media over the last uh, couple of months since the or last month and a half since the book came out. And one of the reasons, and I wish I could remember who said this because I want to give them credit, but in, I, I read someone made an observation about the second week your book was out about why is the system reacting to you? Because like when Todd and I wrote Fauci and Bargain and we were like, okay, you know, something's going to be wrong. We got something wrong. And 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 when they saw the book go number one, this, the medical system's going to come at us. And we were like hunkered down, ready to take them on, right? And it never happened. You know, we had to get something wrong in the book. You know, we're talking about a subject matter that's beyond our credentials. We did our, our best homework, but chances are there's something we got wrong that they could find that one thing and exploit it. And Todd and I were like waiting for the blowback and it never arrived. And that kind of shocked us. On your In your book, the blowback was instantaneous. And I saw someone proffer a hypothesis to why that is. And, and, and basically they said that you, all right, attractive suburban mom, you are the profile of how the entire feminized evangelical church has been constructed to attract you. That you are the composite of the uplifting and hope-filled Christian music station in every town. It's Megan Basham's the mom, you know? And, and the hardest thing is how to drop the kids off at a government school I shouldn't be taking them to so I can meet my Pil- get to my Pilates class in time. And, and, I, and, and I'm stressed out, and I need to make sure about making that, making that Pilates class, all right, to make the, pre, the pre-Pilates stretch so I don't walk in last and I need to be uplifted and hope filled. The fact that you basically Clarence Thomas them is what this said, that that they couldn't handle being hit from the likes of you. And that forced them to respond in ways that maybe, frankly, if someone like me had written the book, they would have just ignored it and tried to bury it. But now that the symbol of what they've done to the church is saying, yeah, I'm going to call BS on this. They could not avoid the come hither when it came from you. 
Yeah, I think that was a really insightful comment. I think it's right. And I think not just me as that suburban mom, but you also had people like Ali Beth Stuckey, like Elisa Childers, like uh, Rosaria Butterfield. So all of us who are representative of supposedly this target demographic and truly the women in the church and in evangelical ranks who gave so many of these men their platform, I do think that's why they felt like they had to respond. And also because the numbers, I think initially there was a little bit of a cone of silence that maybe some of the bigger names I mentioned, Russell Moore, J.D. Greer, former Southern Baptist Convention president, uh, mega church pastor, that some of them felt like, well, maybe we'll just hang back. But I think when they saw a lot of women like me responding to it, then at that point they went, oh, we can't ignore this. So what I've seen over the last weeks, um, what I certainly hoped for was maybe some repentance. And in fact, that's not what I'm seeing. What I have heard from J.D. Greer, from some of these other essayists who are standing in for them, is, well, Megan Basham recognizes a real problem in the church, which in itself is interesting that they're saying that, because they're acknowledging then that there was something they weren't getting. And I find that funny that they're now going, mm -hmm. oh, there is a problem, but we weren't talking about it before, but we have to give her that because so many people see it. We will immediately look like liars with our heads in the sand if we don't acknowledge that what she's writing about has ha been happening. But then what they do is say, but it's not me and my friend. It's some other unnamed people that we need to deal with. A and the substance and the evidence that she brings forward against me is not right because of this reason. A and a lot of what that will boil down to is, um, well, she's misinterpreting all of the things I said and all of the people I've been associated with. And to that, I can only say it's the equivalent of if you have a friend who is repeatedly making racist jokes and derogatory racist commentary, but then says, oh, but I'm not a racist. You're misinterpreting me. That's essentially what they're doing. They were uh, hmm. peddling the COVID narrative. They were implementing DEI policies. They were embracing racial quotas. They were saying that we should say Black Lives Matter. But then they're trying to say, oh, but wait, later I issued a disclaimer and said that's not what I meant. So if you took their commentary at face value, that they say is the problem. Like a guy like Ed Stetzer, for example, who essentially became the Tariq Aziz for Francis Collins to the evangelical church uh, during COVID. Does he come forward, you know, now that the, the COVID vaccine is a completely discredited substance, um, now that all the information we didn't know at the time about some of the just ghastly experiments uh, funded uh, on, on Francis Collins' watch has... Has Ed Stetcher come forward and said, you know what, man, that was my bad on that. I mean, I should not have, um, I should not have exposed him to the brethren. Anybody, anybody showed any humility at all? Anybody? Uh, no. In fact, what you have seen is some of those articles disappearing off of websites. So Ed Stetzer's articles in particular disappearing off Christianity Today, where they used to live. They're not there anymore. So there's been a little bit of a, an attempt to memory hold the record here. And I think that's something that we're going to continue to see because what we have to understand is that so much of their influence depends on these discredited leaders. And, and I'm talking about the institutions, not just the individual. So if you look at someone like Ed Stetzer, a, a Wheaton College that he was associated with, a Biola, can't afford to confront what he is because they have now built their reputations around him. And you have certainly seen the same thing with uh, the Gospel Coalition and Tim Keller. So the Gospel Coalition has been one of the organizations that has come out um, very strongly against me, condemning this book, in fact, calling it a, a ninth commandment violation. So sort of doing that continual spiritual mm. manipulation that if you call attention to what Tim Keller said and you uh, start to reevaluate his legacy in terms of how he denigrated Trump voters, how he denigrated um, red state Christians who uh, resisted those COVID narratives and resisted those COVID authoritarian policies, then in that case, they're saying you are um, violating the ninth commandment. That's a, a false witness, even though I document all of the things that Tim Keller said, all of the groups that he was involved with, specifically uh, providing citations for where you can go read these articles. So if you look at a gospel coalition, 
their own institutional power and respect depends on the legacy of someone like Tim Keller. So they can't afford to have any criticism coming at him. And so I think that's what you're seeing is very much a, a fight for their survival. Weird, because I maybe I'm wrong. I thought self-examination and repentance were fundamental to the Christian walk, but I, I could be mistaken about that. Before we let you go, well, what's the most yeah. surprising react? Go ahead. Did you want to react to that? Go ahead. Well, just that that was part of what I found was so interesting is some of these gospel coalition writers who will say, yes, Megan Basham has identified a real problem, but they don't say who then is the real problem. If they think I've identified mm -hmm. a it's real a nebulous, problem yeah. of liberalism coming into the church and being funded by left-wing actors, then why don't they call out those people who they believe are the real problem? They Amen. don't do that. They just attack me. Amen. What's been the most surprising reaction you've seen since your best-selling book came out? Um, well, I can tell you the most encouraging reaction I've seen is from so many people who have rallied and refused to accept this gaslighting. Um, you know, for a moment there, and you know what this is like, you will feel like you're out there all alone <laughs> and you will feel like, mm -hmm. oh gosh, um, I, I'm facing just, you know, hordes of, of angry PhDs is essentially what it will feel like for a second. And then you <laughs> will have the people who stand up, who put their reputations on the line to back you. Um, someone like Rosaria Butterfield, who, if you're familiar with her, she left a, a life of lesbianism to come to Christ and put her reputation on the line to defend me. Um, someone like Oz Guinness, who I write about Trinity Forum, an organization that he founded that has been co-opted by left-wing actors. He stepped forward to endorse the book after this criticism had started. So those are the kind of things that have really surprised me and been very much a blessing. Um, in terms of the negative reaction from institutional leaders, that hasn't surprised me at all. Um, I expected it to come. But I did expect it to be a little more straightforward in terms of I thought they would defend their positions. I thought they would say it's OK mm -hmm. that we argued for racial quotas. It's OK that we argued for locking down your church. That's not what they're doing. Instead, they're trying to pretend like they never said those things and nuance their very clear records and comments to death. Well, yeah, I've, I've been there, what you described. And you start doubting yourself, like, did I, I did all this homework. Am I wrong, right? And so you just yeah. stay, you end up staying the course. And, and that's why I wanted to, to, give, to bring you back on to talk about the book one more time, uh, to let you take a victory lap, and so that I could say to you in front of our audience what I have said to you privately already before, but well done, good and faithful servant. All right? I mean, you Thank have... You. You did you did what you were called to do, and you have been faithful. and uh, and And I think that uh, now that you've been faithful in a little, I think you're going to see God uh, let you be faithful over that much more. So, well done. Well, thank you so much, Stephen. I, I've said this privately, but your support early on, especially, uh, I really believe open the door to make this happen. Um, I mean, way back a couple of years ago, you were one of the very first people to bring me on and to talk about this subject and to recognize the importance of it. So I, I can't tell you how much I appreciate that and what it's meant to me and what I believe it's meant to the church. Thank you very much for that. And we've always got your back. All right. So even now, now that you're going on to bigger and better things and, <laughs> you know, you're talking to Mike Huckabee and everything now, but we're, don't forget the little people here on your, on your, on your way to the top. All right. Thank you. <laughs> Never. <laughs> All right. Thank you, Megan. Take care. Thanks, Steve. It is a fantastic book. Uh, and if you have not read it, Shepherds for Sale, How Evangelical Leaders Traded the Truth for a Leftist Agenda. And it takes the same approach that, that Todd and I took on Fauci and Bargain, a relentless amount of footnotes and evidence to back up the scandalous claims in the book. So before we get out of here, um, I was really glad to see Paint Your Life is back because maybe the coolest gift I have given my mom the last few years came from Paint Your Life. I took the the oldest photo I have of my mom and I together and I gave it to them uh, uh, for them to do a glossy portrait of it. There it is. Thank you for that, Aaron. And I mean, my mom was blown away when she saw that. Okay. So um, if you're looking for the Christmas gift this year, what could I come up with for the person that has everything or something new, something original? Paint Your Life will take a unique hand-painted portrait 
um, of you. It's not AI. I mean, this is hand painted. All right. Um, any picture, no matter how worn, they can recreate it for you and preserve it for you um, with that level of, of handiwork and craftsmanship. It, it's fantastic stuff. Whoever you give it to will absolutely love it and cherish it. You can order now. Uh, to get your Paint for Life's early bird holiday offer with 20% off your painting right now. So that's for a limited time. Get 20% and free shipping. To get this special offer, text the word DACE, my last name, DACE, to 87204. That's text DACE to 87204. Text DACE to 87204 with Paint Your Life. Celebrate the moments that matter most. You won't regret it. Trust me, my mom still raves about this, and it's been several years since uh, I got her this gift. Text DACE to 87204. Then finally, don't forget tonight, all the big debate coverage here at The Blaze. Blaze TV.com slash DACE. You get the pre-show, the post-show, the in-show chats. Blaze TV.com slash DACE. Use the promo code DEBATE to get $40 off. It's our biggest subscription discount ever. To join us tonight, blazetv.com slash dace, promo code DEBATE. That'll do it for our show here today. Todd and Aaron are going to hang around with me a little bit longer, and uh, we'll come up with something to do for the overtime for Blaze TV for subscribers, whom we'll see you tonight at blazetv.com slash dace. For the rest of you, see you tomorrow. Till then, Romans 828.